All right, just another minute or so. We do have a nice, uh, full and interesting agenda today. So I'm excited to get started on it. Uh, it is two minutes after. Um, so I think we may be able to get started. I know, Shelly, you've got uh, something both you and Alex have designed docs to introduce. Um, and we do have uh, only just a few people who aren't already aware of them uh, on. So I'm not sure if those make sense to introduce later in the meeting or what we want to do with those. Um, it's up to you if you'd like to start now, or maybe we can jump down to Alex's cryo uh, topic. Yeah, sure. OK, yeah, let's do okay. that. So uh, I'll start with the cryo topic, but we don't have to follow up with the QMU image uh, topic. We can leave that to the end. Um, okay, so there's this uh, cryo PR that fixes uh, a behavior and uh, the longstanding behavior. Um, if you can pull up that PR, it'll, it'll make a little bit more sense. Sure. So it's fixing a long-standing behavior with, where the file mode is not being passed to uh, to the device. So in the Kubernetes case, that would be for the block PVC, for instance. And what I think happens is that for a while, you could get away without uh, using uh, this cryo uh, feature gate that passes security context uh regarding block devices block pvcs and this pr actually fixes that so you do have to explicitly set a feature gate to be able to uh, manipulate block pvcs as non-root so uh if you, if you click on the cherry pick um the original pr is embedded mm -hmm. in the in there somewhere yeah yeah that that has the full explanation um I think it's a big issue. I, I opened a thread in Slack, I'm trying to understand like if this is desired. And um, a couple of things come to mind. First, this broke uh, Hypershift first. I think it broke Hypershift CI. I don't know if we have uh, anyone on the call here. Alexander may have seen it. I'm not sure though. I don't know if it's familiar to you. Yes, it, it, it did break hypershift CI. Yeah. Cool. So and they worked around it by using file system PVCs for now. But okay. Okay, so that that was uh, one issue. Uh, this is how this revealed itself. We had uh, Oren from Hypershift uh, just reach out and we we discovered that's the culprit. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, OpenShift, which I think is impacted. I mean, out of the box, OpenShift, I don't think block PVCs will be writable for non-root. So that's a, that's a worry. Mm -hmm. um, and Hubert CI, I guess, if, if this change is really desired, we have to uh, explicitly set a feature gate everywhere, basically everywhere, yeah upstream downstream CIs. So is there a reasonable course of action for us? I see that there's some discussion. Um, like, it sounds like that. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to understand, like, if is there a technical controversy at this point? Or is it just a lot of work to backport things? Or like you I see, these are backports for the cryo fix that we just looked at right all the way back to Yeah. And, yeah. and thus, they're also uh, going to show up for for Qbert CI. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I guess we don't. I, I guess I am a little unsure if this is like desired. I mean, it, it could be seen as like a breaking backport. So, uh, if anyone can chip into the at least the OpenShift discussion, which I believe is. Uh, it's just the only place I could think of where I could get like cryo people attention. Okay. So if anybody could chip in, just make sure it's intended. If it is intended, yeah, it's just about doing the work. Okay. 
Sounds good. I'll definitely be looking into that discussion and it would be great to have some uh, other of you representing there. Thanks for reporting it here, Alex. Um, it's definitely going to be impactful for our use case one way or the other. Yeah, that's uh, all for this topic and uh, we don't have to go for the QM. Well, so ahead. it may actually make sense to do this topic because we I see that we have Stefan here who has um, perhaps has some good context and maybe can offer advice. So like I wanted to just call his name out and maybe we can touch on it quick and just see if there's um, any thoughts here just because I know that we have some people with knowledge of this. Awesome. Um, I'm for it. So uh, it's yet another discussion about the QMU image convert cache mode. We've had a bunch of these in the past. And recently, another one surfaced in the form of uh, this bugzilla. Basically, someone has a, a home lab, which doesn't look too shabby to me, like a, like a good SSD in there and they're hitting uh, a bunch of OM kills on imports. And I mean, they wouldn't hit those OM kills if they had used uh, C groups V2, but that it's going to be a while until we get C groups V2. And we have a lot of versions of uh, OpenShift still doing uh, C groups V1 and kubernetes supported versions that do c groups v1 and i mean i'm convinced by this bugzilla to take another look at what we're doing with the cache mode so um the the claim by the author here is that by using write back we're basically uh masking like bad storage like running away from the issue of having bad storage, not the other way around. So I believe the quote was that we, yeah, using write back to compensate for slow storage that cannot handle all direct semantics. So uh, I was just going to get some thoughts on that. Is I mean, to me, I always thought that using the page cache is we, we wouldn't be in the wrong, like. For sure, we would just be using the page cache, be doing a good thing. But apparently, this could be regarded as like uh, something you would do to overcome, like not up to par storage. So I'm, I'm just want to get thoughts on that. If that's true, if somebody can advise, or maybe that's uh, not something you could determine for sure. So uh, we have a bit of experience with this. Um, one problem with, um, if you're copy, basically if you're copying a file, which I guess is what you're trying to do here with a QM image convert, um, you, and, and these files are pretty big, like gigabytes usually. Um, if you use the page cache, you basically evict all your um, sort of useful local pages for other processes and things. Um, for data that you're probably not going to read again immediately after it's written to disk. Mm -hmm. So we have found it um, useful to be able to um, bypass the page cache by using odirect. And there are other techniques as well, actually, but um, QMU offers this odirect mode. Um, because if you think about it, you might, you might have, you know, your page cache on a machine, which might have, you know, a few hundred gigabytes of RAM. Um, you know, you don't, you can't really afford to get rid of 10 gigabytes of page cache that's being used, you know, to, to cache sort of programs and other data, um, unless you're actually going to immediately read that data again, straight after writing it to disk, which if you're just copying a file is, is not usually the case. So um, that's the sort of problem here. Um, we did a lot of stuff in MBD kit using an alternate method, not using ODirect, but a different method to avoid trashing the page cache when you copy files. And as I said, QM image convert has this ability to use uh, odirect. Do we, uh, thanks for that context. Do we know, I'm trying to remember from my rev history what the, um, like the 
typical device that can't support uh, Odirect is? Like, are we finding that most of the storage is able to support that? I, I believe that Overt had a method where we'd try to open the device Odirect, and if that failed, then we'd fall back to uh, to this. So I'm wondering if that might be a good approach, but I'm just trying to figure out how often we'll fail on the Odirect case. I'm, I'm going to say NFS, but um, I, I also can't remember what the exact devices are that fail with Odirect. Okay. So there is a, a I'll find it in a minute, but there is a really interesting um, uh, posting that Linus did about how you avoid trashing the cache. And it has nothing to do with Odirect, but there's, there's actually a better way to Right files. Obviously, if you're using QMU, you have to use Odirect because that's what they supply. But there are better techniques for writing files without trashing the page cache. Okay. Actually, cool. the next point is really similar to what, what you raised, Adam. Is a bunch of projects I could find, like OpenStack Nova, that uh, opted for this uh, approach of using cache none if if the target can handle Odirect. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it just falls back to write back. It just it seems like a convention almost. I I even found a few other projects that yeah use this. Maybe like you said, maybe Overt did the same thing. I didn't pretty up to me. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I recall like a little uh, Python function that checked uh, if the device is is able to support it, and the only way you know is by just trying to open the file. Uh, with the yeah. odirect flag. And then uh, if it works, you can close it and then launch with the cache equals none. If it doesn't work, you try uh, right back. So maybe that's something we should try. Uh, I mean, the problem is, is it's not, it may solve this particular user's issue if they, if cache equals none works for them. But if it doesn't work, I mean, they still, have, we're still gonna use the page cache and they'll still hit the issue. Um, but I do think that there's a good reason, as Richard points out, to do uh, to do this regardless of this particular user and or uh, C groups V1 limitations, because it's just going to generally play nicer with the working set of the node. So we, we had uh, the cache at none uh, for the longest time, and uh, people had issues with that. Uh, I was trying to find the actual uh, GitHub issue, so we have some context. But oh, it was. I the... believe somebody had an NFS, and it was super slow with the cache none. Uh, so that's why we switched it to write back. Well, it was yeah. I think that's what it, it was. Uh, it was slow because of the uh, the. I think you have to care about the block size when you're writing, and I don't know exactly how that works. But like we found that yeah, if you if you write it and then you you do a sync and wait for the sync to complete, like um, the kernel was doing a more efficient job of batching the, the writes to the device than QMU was or something. Yes, so, so this could be seen as a, a performance bottleneck, a limitation of QMU IMG. Maybe QMU IMG needs to think a little bit more carefully about the um, IO pattern that it generates. Uh, so that it can take advantage of Odirect without hitting this kind of poor performance, say on say on NFS. Um, mm -hmm. So that that is one possible solution here um, to to go and and optimize QMU IMG. I think the reason why we haven't really done this or invested in it too much is because this is mostly a C groups V one problem for a lot of you know users. They would just switch to write back. <laughs> and, and be done with it, right? You switch to write back, you don't see this issue. It's only mm -hmm. with C groups V1 that you can't really rely on write back because it's going to kill your user space processes. Mm -hmm. But um, we, so if, if this is something that is um, important to, to get working and make efficient, then I think raising like a, a, a JIRA story and basically requesting for the VERT team to go and optimize um, QMU IMG for a scenario where it's performing poorly with Odirect is something that could definitely be done. Okay, let me take a note of that. Um, I'm trying to capture like there's so like um, uh, switching to Odirect. Oops, I can have uh, other benefits, including 
Why not evicting useful data? Oh, well, from I can't type this morning. I apologize. Um, from the page cache, we noticed um, performance issues um, due to slow. Um, I don't know how to write this of IO in QMU image. This could be addressed in QMU if needed. Open uh, Vera. Okay. So yeah, let's uh, we'll consider this. Um, I think that is a good uh, any I guess I'll ask if anyone else has any other comments that we I think we got some really good information around this, so I appreciate that from everyone. Um, I guess we need to decide if we want to uh, try using O direct again, but yeah, I think that we will satisfy one person and make another person upset with with making a switch like that. So I, I think we discussed uh, adding a field that people can actually pick their uh, cache mode. Mm -hmm. uh, so that if none is better for you, you can pick none, or maybe we default it to none. And if, if right back is better for you, you can set it, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think otherwise, I wonder if, simply like really the the yeah okay yeah i think that that's interesting and then with right back we'll do an automatic sync before we uh mark the data volume uh as is completed uh where with o direct we don't have to do that um so yeah this is something okay so that's another option um i hate to expose uh a, a knob like this is complicated enough for the experts to discuss so trying to put an option like this in the hands of an end user is going to be fraught with its own peril so uh well it might be something to put in a storage profile or something like that yeah i just thought about that uh, putting it in a storage profile but then how how would you know what uh what backs the the backend storage so for example for uh, ocs like how would you know it's not backed by something that's playing badly with the uh, odirect yeah uh what and it, it yeah it may not be provision or specific um in terms of the configuration where this is a problematic um, i i think a solution that uh if i was in the cuper perspective or the cdi perspective i think what i would do is i would always enable um right back and I would also need QMU IMG to be um, modified so that it's very careful about how much page cache it dirties so that it will not uh, be killed by cgroups v1. That way you don't have to expose anything to the users and it always works. And then at some point in the future, when cgroups v2 becomes um, you know, widely used, then maybe it would be possible to to, to think about to think about whether whether this keep doing this but essentially what I'm saying is that if we can make QMU IMG never um, abort due to the out of memory which I think is possible um, then you could just use write back all the time you wouldn't have to worry about it you would not have to expose a setting to the user Mm -hmm. yeah I like actually really like that uh, approach where you know you give it a certain number of megabytes of cache it's allowed to use and i think it could flush that um and then fill it again and flush or something like that in order to uh to manage its usage okay um sounds good let's uh take this i guess maybe offline for the rest of it so we can move on to some other topics um thanks again for all the the input i think um some of us can have a, I mean, if we have an issue in um, 
uh, in CDI, maybe we could take it there and discuss options. Um, and then, you know, we'll decide if we want to, you know, improve uh, QMU, is, uh, QMU image, or is there something that we can give the, the, this user now to move them forward and stuff like that. So um, thanks for raising it, Alex. Um, let's uh, jump down to Stefan's topic. Uh, if you are ready, uh, you can bring that one up and then we'll circle back up to the uh, design proposals that we've got in queue. Okay, thanks, Adam. Um, I just wanted to, to find out, um, I think in the past, we talked a little bit about um, the ability to stream or, or populate images in the background without having to um, download the entire um, you know, backing file or, or whatever you call it, the, 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 the disk image that might be stored in the container registry. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I haven't been following along, so I don't know, maybe, maybe this already exists and you guys have done it, or maybe you guys have hit some roadblocks or maybe haven't looked at it yet, but I was just curious about um, the status of it and if maybe there's any any stuff you need from QMU in order to be able to implement this feature. The big advantage being you don't have to wait for a disk image to be populated um, before you can launch a new VM from the disk image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we haven't, uh, I, I would say the, I mean, somebody else definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but the closest thing I can think of uh, to us doing this is we worked on a feature to try to do um, HTTP uh, CD-ROM source images. So the idea is it's much easier to uh, have QMU connect to a service that's providing storage like a uh, yeah an HTTP server um, and for hot plugging CD-ROMs or changing media. So we thought of that as a really good use case uh, for something like this. Uh, it ended up being rejected uh, in the KubeVert community because they did not want to have a like a network type uh, volume uh, for virtual machines. And so we kind of dropped it. It's sort of the use of or emulation of CD-ROM devices isn't really qu quite as interesting in a, in a Kubernetes landscape. There's lots of different ways to, you know, kind of provision VMs and things. So the project, there's PRs out there and stuff, but it sort of got abandoned. Um, in terms of regular like bootable disks, like for example, um, you know, cloning a, an existing image for a new VM, it's not something we've focused on where we've been more focused on taking advantage of CSI clones of existing imported images as a faster way to provision. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone else has any examples of things that they've tried or, um, uh, any other work in this area? So, um, uh, Stefan, did you have? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, I want to I want to respond to that. So, um, if you have a PV that has the image you want to clone, then you can clone it using the the Kubernetes storage uh, APIs, as, as you mentioned. But what about um, don't don't you have disk images that are stored in the uh, image registry as disk.img files? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. so, so we isn't have... that typically what your kind of master image, your golden image that you provision from would be, or are people just putting their golden images on on a PV and then cloning that PV? So, so the the golden images are actually delivered. Um, like, if we go, if we talk downstream, the flow is that like the rel uh, guest image will be delivered uh, in the the registry with the the rest of the containers for OpenShift virtualization. So, the model that's employed downstream is that the the masters would be stored there. We actually encourage anyone who wants to use the data import cron feature and all the golden images uh, workflows that are built in uh, to do the same with their own registry. Um, but then what happens is the data import cron uh, logic will take that and detect when there's a new, whatever, if we have the latest version on the cluster and it will trigger a CDI import in the background. Um, so like a registry where the container is pulled uh, to the node and the image is copied to uh, to the PV automatically. And then anytime a new image is pushed to that registry, um, an updated one, 
then it's automatically update pulled into a new PV and we manage kind of garbage collection. So this is the flow. So what you'll find um, when you install the, the downstream product is that usually by the time you're ready to create your first virtual machine after installing the operator, uh, all the OS images have already been imported from the from the registry. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for educating me about that. So it sounds like it's it's basically solved because in practice, people will have their golden images in PVs when at the time of use. Yeah, I, th I think so. And we definitely considered some of the, the streaming stuff. I, I still consider it like interesting um, uh, of things that can be done here. Um, we actually, there was an idea um, to uh, extend the container disk specification. So today the container disk spec has, you basically pull the container down and it has a file called disk.img in it. I, um, I think it's in, it may be in a subdirectory or something, but it's a, it's a well-known location and basically kubevert knows, uh, or C and CDI know that this is where the image is, but there was another idea that we had where you could have a container disk that had a uh, socket file or some other thing in it instead of a disk image. And when that was there, then QMU would connect, uh, would be instructed to connect to that socket. And what this would allow you to do is provide your own arbitrary implementation of supplying, like connecting data to that socket. Uh, for QMU. So it would be a way to kind of like experiment with some of these streaming options or uh, QCOW2 layers, for example, if that's something that you wanted to try to implement uh, for a particular use case that you could do that. Um, and then it kind of keeps the implementation of that outside of the kubevert code because they're really just, uh, there are so many different ways as, as everyone here knows um, to construct the QMU block layer into different cool things um, and it's difficult to support all the, all of them. So this could be another interesting idea for something like this. I'm not sure if you had a specific use case in mind uh, other than just sort of route, like what you mentioned here, which is that sort of the instant provisioning case. Okay, thanks a lot, Adam. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, any other comments or thoughts on that topic before we go on? Great. Okay. So let's pop back up to the top, and I'll uh, I'll ask Shelly if she'd like to uh, discuss. Uh, let's maybe give some context of what we're trying to do with this uh, design document, and then uh, we could encourage some folks to uh, take a look at this give their comments yeah yeah sure hey um so one of our new um work that we're planning to do and this is the design proposal for it is basically um having a way to use the new kubernetes api or volume populators yeah. uh, with uh, vms um in a way that we will get VMs we previously populated with our disk images and also benefiting from um, our storage knowledge that how we use in data volumes that we can provide a missing for example missing volume mode or access mode and it gets filled automatically with our knowledge of the PVC storage. Um, so that's basically the, the idea, the motivation. Our planning to do it um, is basically add to the VM uh, a field similar to data volume templates, uh, which will be called volume claim templates. Um, and there, uh, yeah, there's the API example. Um, and there uh, you can mention uh, the information that you want and the information that you can uh, miss. And it will be filled similarly to how we do in data volume controller um, in the PVC that we will generate. Um, that's more or less the major work that we plan with this design. Uh, if you have any questions for now,
I'm trying to, I was trying to show the API without the conversation. Yeah. Uh, you, can I forget. Hide, you can hide the comment. Okay, yeah. Let's... If you hit the three dots on the top right, there should be a few file and that will render it for you. No, no, up, oh, up in the up here. page, yeah. So comment. Okay, nice. I knew it was somewhere, I just forgot. So uh, let's go down. So, all right, so uh, here, is what she was talking about with an uh, basically what we would do. So this looks pretty similar to the uh, data volume template section, uh, yeah. but it's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you can see that um, for the source, we have the data source ref, a new Kubernetes field, uh, which will mention the source that you want to be populated for your PVC. It can be an import, uh, upload or clone. Um, you can uh, look at our CDI volume populators uh, doc in the CDI repo. You will need to create the, the source uh, scar before. You can see here we have in the same manifest both YAMLs. Uh, and when you post it, the VM will basically um, see this template, uh, check which fields need to be filled if needed, and create this PVC with this source and it will get populated with our CDI volume populators. And yeah, I think Shelly, you mentioned um, like this is a lot of uh, work and in introducing a new API for something that's awfully similar to what we already have today. But the, yeah. as, as you mentioned, the main motivation here is that we discovered some uh, issues with data volumes and how they yeah. behave with um, third party um, things in the cluster, such as backup uh, software or disaster recovery workflows that uh, make us want to move away from the data volume concept uh, as a sort of wrapper for storage and go directly back to the PVC. And if we do that, we should find a much smoother integration of uh, our workloads with the cluster. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, so um, I guess at this stage you're looking for uh, comments or input on the design PR. Yeah, um, we can discuss two things uh, if we have time and we want. One thing is the, the cross namespace issue that this um, faces. It's, um, in order to do cross namespace, we'll have to wait for the beta version of Kubernetes support for this cross namespace um, sources. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that we need to, to see how we exactly address, how we um, stress this is um, currently not supported with this new API. And uh, there's the open question underneath that I did, uh, uh, I did talk with um, Michael about um, the whole concept of generate name. Mm -hmm. It's something that we couldn't use with data volumes, and uh, it's it will be really cool to use it with this new um, this new API. It will allow us to just uh, keep applying this uh, YAML of a PVC, and each time it will create a VM and a PVC with a generated name. So we thought how we can add a generate name to the PVC itself, but Michael uh, um, raised a really cool um, idea of basically in the template to put uh, a constant name like my PVC, for example, and in the volumes list also put this my PVC name, but before creating the VMI, we'll basically add a prefix of the VM generated name to the PVC name, and that will create us a PVC generated name, basically a unique uh, generated name. Mm. So when, when we have the VM generated name to create a PVC with this, generated name and the provided username, create the PVC. And before applying the VMI um, spec, we will change this uh, generated PVC name also in the volumes list, which yeah. I think is cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to think about how that works with restoring virtual machines, if there's any kind of, uh, you know, or like uh, DR workflows and things like that, if, if that, still works, I guess it should. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't see why not, because once you created the VM, the generated name is basically a constant name of, of the VM. Uh, and yeah. we, we also, when we, uh, what currently goes is that if the VM has a generate name, uh, when you create the VMI, you change it to have a name, which is the generated VM name. Mm -hmm. so we, al we already are use doing something similar about using generated name as a const in the VMI spec. Okay. So it would be interesting if you could, yeah, if that's like a proposal, perhaps we could add uh, sort of a, a description yeah, of how that works. I'm planning to update the design later on today with uh, some updates from the review and the solution. Okay. Um, you mentioned also the issue with cross namespace populators. Um, I think another thing that would be interesting is to see, I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what it would look like um, in the YAML. So for data source ref, is it just that you get to add a namespace, but is there some kind, I can't remember, we should link to the cross namespace population cap or the AP, the alpha API page. Um, I can't remember if there are third, like other objects that have to be created to create that like uh, authorization. Uh, and if that's the case, um, how would that be managed? Because we definitely don't want those authorizations to be part of the spec, I would say. So that would be interesting to me just to kind of see how it works. And then I think this API can be added before we're ready and only work with um, uh, intra namespace populator CRs, but then you know we could support the cross namespace uh, later on potentially. So those are just yeah. some thoughts around that. Um, but yeah, I would love to see like an example of what it looks like um, in that case. Um, in, in CDI, we do we are doing cross namespace with uh with creating tokens uh in cdi and um, so we added namespace to the uh, source if i'm not mistaken michael may may correct me if i'm wrong yeah we um, support cross namespace with data volumes and and uh rather than use the um we still we can't use the namespace field of the data source ref in the PVC, so we add a special annotation that has the namespace. So we get around it with data volumes for now, but you know when we have a, you know, with volume claim templates, it should be the proper support, which requires, in which case, yeah, you set the namespace in the data source ref, and then there are um, yeah resources that have to exist in the source namespace, um, resource grants that grant access to specific resources from other namespaces. Okay. And those are things that should be created by um, those grants. You know, eventually I think uh, what will happen is, you know, data import cron will be updated to um, create those things and then, or SSP or some combination of them um, mm -hmm. to uh, create the cross namespace data sources. Okay. And the grant happens on that side. Is there another object that needs to happen on the in the receiving namespace, or is it just enough to request a namespace? No, it's in the yeah, it's it's uh, the grant is in the source namespace. So okay, all right, interesting. So yeah, if we could see an example of what that looks like um, as a maybe a separate chapter of this design document, I think that would be cool. And then basically, uh, if we find that we don't support that. I mean, I guess if the grant doesn't exist, which it wouldn't until it's supported properly, then that just wouldn't work yet. So it may be a kind of a natural evolution to bring that feature in. Um, okay, so I wanted to just see if, if I could, I'd like to see if anyone has any other comments. We do have actually one other kind of important design proposal to talk about today as well, another feature to call attention to. Um, so any other f uh, closing comments on this one? please do take a look at it and offer your thoughts if you could. Uh, we'd appreciate that. I'm sure Shelley would. So let me go ahead and click on Alex's uh, design doc. And why don't you give us the scoop on this one? And I'm going to try to. Yeah, so uh, 
recently what we discovered is that for some storage backend solution uh, specifically that was uh, Ceph there was this uh, Ceph RBD and there was this specific uh, IO pattern coming from Windows VMs that would just not play nice with the default uh, parameters uh, about utilizing the backend storage and the solution for that ended up being uh, passing a low, lower level mapping option to the uh, kernel rbd driver and this opens up like a, a whole box of potential issues for example uh, we have also providers like portworks that would give you out of the box a large number of uh, of ways to utilize your storage a uh, bunch of storage class objects and each of them uses a different set of parameters and only some of them may be preferable for VM workloads. So this design is about finding a way to uh, basically steer the user towards a storage class that's suitable for VM workloads. So Kubernetes solves this for regular workloads by giving you a default storage class annotation, but it may not be wise for us to piggyback on that because that is suitable for pods, whereas for us, as we've seen with the Windows uh, I.O. pattern, we have our own needs and we have uh, the default, what's best for pods might not be the best for us, basically. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, we get this uh, spe special virtualization storage class so naming is, is not something we have to solve here, but basically it's just instead of a storage class Kubernetes IO, it's just a storage class dot Kubert IO. And that would tell uh that would tell us what's the preferred storage class for VM workloads. And there about there's a bunch of uh, compatibility concerns, um, like cloning between uh one one variation of a of a storage backend to another, for example, somebody may have been using a, the default Kubernetes storage class for a while, and then we upgrade to a version that has a vert specifically a vert storage class, and uh, we may want to clone between them, and uh, we have to make sure that works because that's a very basic uh, usage of the product so um yeah so i i'm thinking that is that's the more gist of it maybe testing is something we can talk about we have to replicate this weird io pattern and observe that it's gone cool um and i think yeah, I think one of the interesting questions would be uh, like, who's responsible for annotating the class? Like in Kubernetes, this is sort of left open. A lot of times it's the cluster administrator. Um, other times it can be the storage vendor. Um, so some storage vendors, when you when they install their operator, they can check if there's currently a default class and then uh, they can set one of their storage classes as default. So I was thinking like, for example, the Steph, uh use case, uh, if they would like to apply this annotation to the storage class they've created for virtualization, they could do that, uh, which would be kind of sensible since it's created for virtualization. So I don't know if there's any um, discussion on that, but that was, I was gonna call that out. It's considered in the design. Um, so I put this part in the non goals as something okay. that an admin or uh, or a storage provider would decide. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, this will be a cluster admin storage provider decision. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, but uh, I I think we'll be really uh, close to what what's happening in Kubernetes. I know a lot of operators like the OCS operator. They just uh, 
they put the default Kubernetes storage class annotation on on the storage class they want to advertise. So mostly, I think that's the RBD RBD one. Mm -hmm. So they just slap the annotation on it, and uh, the user may not even know. Yep. Cool. All right, uh, so we're almost, uh, we're kind of running up on the edge. So I just wanted to make sure that I made some room for uh, questions or comments on this proposal. If anyone has anything or thoughts or wants to weigh in, uh, we'd also appreciate a uh, review on this idea for anyone who wants to weigh in. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, let's see, I think the only thing that we left uh, uncovered so far is the uh, triaging of issues, but we are so close to the end here that I don't know if it makes sense unless anyone's aware of a particular uh, issue that we should try to cover uh, in a minute or two, if there's any specific ones that somebody would like to call out. And if not, I would say let's uh, defer that until next time. I think we're in pretty good shape on issues. Um, and I guess I'll just wrap it up then. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we had some really, uh, really great topics uh, this can, time around. Can I just uh, add a reminder, Adam, for um, our new uh, lightning talk idea? Oh, uh, yes. For those who haven't been in this meeting last, uh, in, in the last meeting, uh, we are wanting to try to do some lightning talks. Um, so if you want to share something in this forum or you would like to hear about something that our, our group can share, um, please feel free to either add it here, send me a message, either, either way is good. So just a reminder. Oh, cool. Thanks. Uh, so are you intending to uh, present this one uh, on a specific, uh, like, have we scheduled that one yet? Or are we just collecting ideas so far? Um, yeah, I think we, we are collecting ideas. I think, I think we, we will, when we will have uh, enough time for a lightning talk in, uh, in this meeting, we can do it and have enough uh, participants that uh, you know, will benefit from this idea like last sure. time. Uh, yeah. wasn't wasn't ideal. Okay, sure, that sounds good. Cool. Uh, thanks for the reminder. Um, so yeah, it's right up here. You can reach out to Shelley directly. Um, and with that, I'm going to close the meeting. So thanks again, everyone, for joining and for your participation. It's great to see you guys. And the next one will be in two weeks, and we hope to see you there as well. Have a great week. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.